Good to be with you this morning, and so thrilled to worship God together. Um, I appreciate your participation in class, and even from some visitors, really, really appreciate that. So encouraging to know that there are others who care about God's Word, who care about not only reading it, not only studying it, but even applying it and doing it and living it. And uh, I'm so grateful for the fellowship that we share in that especially. One of my many pastimes that uh, my wife rolls her eyes at is watching other churches' live streams. I spend a good, a good bit of time watching other churches, and she you know, rolls her eyes because we'll go visit a place, and, and I'll be like, oh, I heard your sermon you know, recently on this topic, and they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I watch your live stream. And she's just like, oh, my. like, or I'll start talking to them as if like, I'm a member here, and I'm like, oh, I remember when you preached on that. You know, that's, that was cool. And I was like, what? But... Anyway, that's, that's one of the things that, that I do, and uh, I, I listen to other guys preach. That's, that's good for me, I think, and listen to, to other, other churches singing especially. It's something that keeps me revived, keeps me energized, and helps to keep me fed spiritually by getting my perspective opened up to what others are studying about and thinking about it. And it especially helps me to stay connected to other saints, other brethren in other places, realizing that we are part of something much bigger than our little group of saints that meets here on, on Edgebrook Lane. We are part of the body of Christ, uh, part of the body of saints that spans the globe. Uh, but one of the churches I typically listen to during the, the course of the week, the, the archive of their live stream, uh, sang the song, Here We Are But Straying Pilgrims, on a Sunday morning uh, recently. And that's not a song I had heard in quite some time until then. Of course, now I've heard it twice. Thank you, Dylan. Appreciate that. Uh, and I actually forgot to ask him about that until like five minutes before services start. So he's good at the pivoting. Appreciate that. Uh, but but I, I haven't heard that song in quite a while until, until these last two times. But it usually catches my ear for a few reasons when I do hear it. Uh, those include the fact that as a child, my aunt thought the chorus lyrics were yonder over the rolling river where the Chinese mansions rise. So, you know, it always brings a smile to my face to think about that uh, misinterpretation of lyrics instead of where the shining mansions rise. Uh, but additionally, the, the unison style in the verses is neat. Uh, I, I, you know, when you hear that, that's different from the way that we usually sing, where everyone sings the same notes. We're all singing uh, in unison. It, it sounds pretty cool. Uh, but most importantly, the message of the song is a good one, and an important one. Here on earth, we really are just straying pilgrims who are not at home, if indeed we are in Christ. But around the same time as I heard that song sung on that live stream, uh, we recently had our first book club, our first prayer study in quite some time. And one of the things in David's prayer in 1 Chronicles 29 that we studied last, not last Thursday night, uh, you know, the one before that, Time is weird. Uh, but that we studied that night, uh, one of the things that stood out to me was that he acknowledged to God that he, David, along with the rest of the nation of Israel, along with God's covenant people in the past even, were in fact strangers on the earth. In other words, they were pilgrims on the earth. They did not belong. They were traveling through. That's how they viewed themselves. But that prayer reminded me even more so of what is said about those listed in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13, that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. At least that's the King James Version's wording. We don't read from that very much these days. The ESV says they were strangers and exiles on the earth, but it communicates that same idea. And yet, even though David, you think about David, he, he dwelt in the promised land. He was in the land God had promised to Abraham. He lived in a beautiful palace, in a house of cedar, where surely he had all the comforts he could desire. We talked about that last week in 2 Samuel 7, where he says, here I live in this palace, this house of cedar, and God dwells in a tent. But, but that's where David lived. He lived in this great home, in the promised land. And yet, he says he and Israel, all the rest of God's people, were strangers, still pilgrims still exiles. And so all that being said, I've been thinking a great deal about this idea of all of us as God's covenant people even today, needing to view ourselves as sojourners, as pilgrims on the earth today. A pilgrim, a stranger, a, a sojourner, that is a person who does not have a permanent home. A person who is on their way to somewhere else. They are a person whose identity is not fully wrapped up in the people they find themselves living among. They're traveling through. They are temporarily there. By definition, they are somewhat 
transient. They are not completely settled. They're not completely comfortable where they are. That's what a pilgrim is. And Hebrews 11 calls us to consider these great people of faith that we're familiar with, not merely as cheerleaders to say, they did it, you can do it too, woo! Uh, that's important. But it also calls us to notice them as examples of the kind of faith and outlook we ought to have as well as we seek to adopt this mindset of a sojourner. So join me, if you would, in Hebrews 11, and let's look at what it means for us to be these pilgrims that the Bible speaks about, these sojourners. The text for our lesson this morning will be Hebrews chapter 11, like I said. I'd invite you there as we begin this morning by reading God's Word together. Hebrews chapter 11, we'll actually begin reading in verse 7. Hebrews 11 and verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised." Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. As we look at that text together, I would suggest to you first that one thing we can notice immediately from the example of these people who the Bible describes as, as pilgrims, as exiles, as sojourners, is this, that pilgrims step out in faith. Pilgrims step out in faith. Abraham is a primary character in the text that we just read. And the really remarkable thing about Abraham in this text that really catches our attention is that we are told he went out not knowing where he was going. Of course, there's a lot remarkable about him there, about you know, the child that he had when he and Sarah were way past their prime, but this is certainly eye-catching at the very least. He went out not knowing where he was going. Now, let's clarify what that means and what that doesn't mean. This is not to say Abraham had no promise from God. He had no indication from God of anything about where he was going. Uh, it's not to say Abraham didn't know that there was a promised land that God was taking him to. God had made that clear. But what Abraham did not know was specifically where that land was going to be. He didn't know the way God was going to take him to get there. He didn't know the time frame involved. He didn't really know any of the details we would always want to know before we set out on a trip. Most of us, anyway. I mean, maybe some of you are fly by the seat of your pants kind of people, and I can relate to that to some degree. But generally, if we're going to make a, a cross-country trip, we want to know where we're going. We want to have a flight booked. We want to have a plan, a route uh, plan, a, a time frame so we can ask off of work. We, we want to know these things, right? We want to know the time frame, the destination, the route, how we're getting there, etc. Abraham didn't know any of that. He didn't know the logistics. God just called him to step out in faith, and he did, not knowing where he was going. And yet he did step out in faith. We know the definition of faith given at the beginning of this chapter, one of the, the few places in the Bible where the Bible says, here's what this word means. Uh, faith is. Now, faith is. That's how chapter 11 begins. But... What did faith specifically mean when applied in Abraham's case? For Abraham, faith meant obeying God, even obeying to the point of moving his family across the known world, despite not knowing so many of the things we would want to know before making a trek like that. For Abraham, faith meant trusting God completely, 
trusting that despite all he did not know, Abraham had to trust that God knew everything, that God was in control, and that God would care for Abraham as long as he continued to trust God's wisdom and obey God's will. And that is really the theme of Hebrews 11. Despite knowing so little in so many of these cases, we look back at these people and be like, we know way more than, than they do about their lives, or about how it was going to turn out. Despite knowing so little, these people trusted God. They had faith. They trusted Him that He knew and that He would provide for them, care for them, lead them, and work all things to their ultimate spiritual best interest. And Abraham models this by moving his family out from his homeland, leaving behind the rest of his family, the life he had known, the support of his relatives, and all that was familiar to him. He left it all behind in order to submit to God's will and God's call. And we may look at Abraham sometimes and say, how could you set out and not know where you're going? You just don't do that, man. Why? But in reality, that's what God calls us to do today. As pilgrims and as sojourners, we are called to the same, to step out and trust God, even when we don't know all the answers. We don't know everything or how God's going to work this to our good or how he's going to take care of us, how he's going to work it to our good in the end. We don't know all of that, but we're called to be like Abraham, to step out in faith and to trust God. We too must step out in faith seeking God's will. That's the key that Abraham did, following God's lead, even when we do not know everything. And, and that can manifest itself in a lot of different ways, can't it? For one, I would imagine that most of us, if not all of us, when we became Christians, did you understand everything you understand now when you became a Christian? Did you, did you get it all at the same level of knowledge? No, the Bible talks about being babes in Christ and being on the milk of the Word, and then, then progressing to the meat, hopefully, uh, if things go as they should. Uh, and, and I know that for me, I, I did not grasp nearly, for example, the depth of Jesus' sacrifice that I understand today. And yet, still today, I'm convinced I don't know the half of it. Uh, but what I did do... Uh, Excuse me, what did I do? And what have so many of you done? Nonetheless, despite our lack of knowledge, we've obeyed Jesus. We obeyed the gospel. We put our trust in him as our Lord and as our Savior. And that's exactly what we're called to do in all things. Despite not understanding everything, whether as a lack of our comprehension uh, or simply because God has not revealed something to us and he hasn't told us, either way, we are called to trust Him and to step out in faith, following Him and His will, even as early as when we first obey the gospel. But this can also manifest itself in our taking a stand that will cause us to experience some negative consequences from a physical standpoint. Some Christians face situations where they are required to either stand up for what they believe in and lose their job, or cave to pressure and, and not stand up and, and keep their job. They may not know what lies ahead. They may not know how they're going to be able to provide for their family. They may not know where their next paycheck is going to come from. And yet they're called to trust God that he's going to provide for them. In situations like that, we as Christians are called to do what Abraham did, to step out in faith and follow God's will, even not seeing how this is going to go. We are called to put our complete faith in God that if we obey his will, if we obey his law, he will take care of us. And this can take so many forms for different ones of us as, as we live our lives and make decisions about where we will go, what we will do, how we will work, how we will live, or anything at all, really. But the bottom line is that many of us will find ourselves making decisions, if we are truly making decisions according to God's will, that may not seem logical from an earthly standpoint, but after praying to God and seeking His will are undeniably best for us spiritually. And while those situations can differ between us, in our different circumstances, one thing that is true for every single one of us who are Christians is that in an even bigger, more profound and general sense, we are called to step out in faith while not knowing really where we are going either, as Abraham did. Now, certainly there's a sense, like Abraham, in which we know where we are ultimately going. We know God has promised us this new land, this heavenly country, this better place. But Abraham knew that too. And yet the Bible says he did not know where he was going. And neither do we have a perfect vision of what the land to which we are going will really be like. 
in my estimation, there is no topic so important to Christian teaching that we know so little about <laughs> as the city God has prepared and promised to us in which we will dwell eternally with him. We have so many questions. What's going to happen when I die? How does this work? Is there a waiting place? Do we go straight there? Are we aware of what happens? Where's it going to be? What's it going to be like? Is everything in Revelation figurative or literal? How are we supposed to take all this? What are we supposed to expect? We really don't know a lot. And yet, we are called to long for it. We are called to work toward it. To work toward that place which we know so little about. We are called, brothers and sisters, to step out in faith toward that better country, that better land, and trust God that it is wonderful and perfect, and that He will provide it to us by faith. And so may we all have such faith that we step out as pilgrims and that we follow God's will and trust Him to provide for us in all ways. But for our second observation this morning, I would call your attention to a second character whose narrative is explored in Hebrews 11 briefly. It's actually where we started reading this morning in verse 7. And it's in close proximity to the statement about those pilgrims or strangers. That character is Noah. And from Noah, we learn another lesson that pilgrims seem different. For Noah's part, he constructed this ark of gopher wood. That's normal, right? No, that's weird. That is strange. God instructed him to do this, and so he makes this ark. That would have marked him as an oddball, I dare say. Can you imagine what Noah's neighbors would have said about this whole building project going on over here in the woods? What is this guy doing? What is going on over there? I mean, here he is building this giant boat when it hasn't even ever rained on the earth. How are you going to get this to the ocean? What's the purpose? What are you doing? I mean, what would you have thought if you were one of his neighbors? I mean, here in America, we mock our neighbors for buying a weird colored car. Did you see that? Oh, what in the world was they thinking when they got that? <laughs> Paint your mailbox a weird color. Did you see that? I can't believe that. I mean, imagine your neighbor starts building an ark in their backyard, and it's never rained. I mean, what? He had to look weird. But not only that, not only his building project, you know, put that aside for a minute, Noah was living different than everyone else. Think about that. Noah was living righteously. Noah was living in a completely different way than all the other people. Even more significant than the giant ark he was building in the backyard. Never mind that. He was living in a way that was the very antithesis of everything the rest of the world at that time was pursuing and chasing after. They were all getting comfortable. They were squeezing every ounce of pleasure they could out of their lives on the earth while Noah was preparing, equipping himself to become a serious pilgrim. You ever think about that? Noah was getting ready to float around on the earth wherever the ark or, or wherever God would take him. By nearly every count imaginable, Noah would have stood out. Noah would have looked real strange. Noah would have been different. Noah would have been weird. And truthfully, so would Abraham. He would have been weird. I can't imagine Abraham's extended family would have stood by without any comment, at least like, what is going on? While he packed up his family and moved them away from the rest of the family tree to who knows where. Literally, who knows where? <laughs> Almost certainly the rest of Torah, uh, Terah's family, sorry, autocorrect, the rest of Terah's family <laughs> would have looked at Abraham differently. And surely to them, Abraham would have seemed different. He chose this life of pilgrimage, which, like Noah, would have stood in stark contrast to all others around him. And let's be clear, him going out on this journey is not like us today. We flew to Alabama really quick on a plane and flew back yesterday. And even in the meantime, we've got FaceTime. Ryder talks to his grandparents in Alabama all the time. And we can text and we can call and keep up with our family even when we move far away. My family probably never thought I would end up in Illinois, but here I am. But it's not as big of a deal. Because we can keep in touch so easily. We can get there really quickly. Cars, planes, those are recent inventions. When Abraham was around, I don't think he could get the Southwest Rapid Rewards points and just, you know, get a little, get a little flight here real quick. And no, it, it was very different. You move away from your family, you are making a significant step out. And likely they wouldn't have understood that. But nonetheless, Abraham chose that life. 
He chose it intentionally. He made the life of a pilgrim his way of living, which would have certainly made him seem odd to those around him. But in doing so, he was choosing a life of trusting God and following him, which is the best kind of different there is. But getting back to Noah, looking at his example, we are also called to spend our lives, our time, our money, our energy, building something for God. We are called to build his kingdom. And brothers and sisters, can I be frank with you? This is going to mark us as odd, too. We're going to look strange if we really do this right. If we truly adopt this pilgrim mindset, our lives are going to look vastly different from those around us. Noah spent his time, his life, his resources, and even his energy building something for God. People looked at him and would have been very well able to tell there's something different going on with that guy. And the same is true for us. If we were to take our cues from these great examples of faith and adopt this mindset and lifestyle of a pilgrim, people will inevitably be able to tell by the way that we spend our time and our money and our energy that we're different. Pilgrims seem different. And I would have said pilgrims look different, but I liked the alliteration thing I had going, so I figured I'd keep that. But you get the point. The pilgrims seem different. That's in their nature. And let me suggest this to you. We need to be okay with that. We need to be okay with that. We need to be okay with looking different. I'm not suggesting we need to be chasing after being odd, like we just need to make ourselves as odd as possible just so we stand out and we get some attention. No, not just for the sake of being odd. I'm suggesting that we need to commit ourselves wholeheartedly to discipleship to being followers of Jesus and people of God. And then we need not give up or back off when that takes our lives in a different direction than the rest of the world is going. Pilgrims seem different. That's who we ought to be. May we be true pilgrims who are always willing to be seen as different. There's so much that could be said about the life of a pilgrim, but I want to offer you just, just one more thought this morning, and then the lesson is yours. That is that pilgrims seek something better. Pilgrims seek something better. One thing we haven't talked about so far this morning is the context that most people in our country would call to mind when you talk about pilgrims. What would most people in our country think about? Well, they think about the Mayflower, right? They think about the pilgrims who came over and settled this country uh, in 1620. Uh, and while all these characteristics that we see in the biblical pilgrims are true of them too, of those Mayflower pilgrims to some degree, this one is particularly true of the Mayflower pilgrims, as it's really true of all pilgrims of all time. They've all been seeking something better. No one leaves their homeland behind. No one walks away from everything they've known and loved. No one walks out of what is familiar and comfortable into what is unknown and uncomfortable unless they believe something is better out there. This was true of the Mayflower pilgrims. It's true of Abraham. It was true of Israel. At least at their best, it was true of Israel. At their worst, they wanted to go back to Egypt, but we won't talk about that. At their best, it was true of Israel. And it's true of all those of us today who mark ourselves as pilgrims, who make ourselves as sojourners in this world today for the sake of Christ and the gospel. Specifically, Hebrews 11 tells us that Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations. This is ultimately the better thing that Abraham was seeking and that he left his home in search of. Abraham had a city. He had Ur of the Chaldees and later Haran, where his family was settled, and his, he had an established way of life. You might even say Abraham had roots there. That sounds like a foundation, right? Sounds like a pretty decent foundation to me, actually. You plant your roots, you've got your community, you've got your people to help you out and watch your kid when you go on a date night, or you know that kind of thing. But Abraham had that. Ur, Haran, his family was there. You know, Abraham left it. Hebrews 11 tells us he left it because he was seeking a city with foundations. Abraham had something good, but he was seeking something better. But the something better that Abraham was looking for was not equivalent to the new land of promise and opportunity that the Mayflower pilgrims went off in search of. Yeah, this land was better in many senses than England, or better than many places in Europe. Uh, but Abraham was looking for something much better than their something better. 
Abraham is looking for the city whose designer and builder is God, verse 10 tells us. In a sense, the entire earth was designed and built by God, was it not? God created all that is here, and yet mankind has come along and sinned and corrupted this world with our sin. So what was Abraham looking for that was kind of like creation, but also better than the current state of creation? Well, Abraham was looking for a new creation, a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God, that has not been corrupted as this world has. The holy city, the new Jerusalem spoken of in Revelation 21, that's what Abraham was looking for. He was looking for the new heavens and the new earth that the prophet Isaiah spoke about. But here's the thing about Abraham. He did not long for it with wistful hope. He didn't just sit around and and dream, maybe one day there will be something better. Now, Abraham's looking for this city. What did it lead him to do? It led him to action. It led him to act on this hope. It caused him to walk away from all that was comfortable. And to sum it up, Abraham's search for this greater city caused him to live in a way that was not bound by earth's affections and ties. It caused Abraham to live in a way that was aimed towards something greater to come. His life here was transient. It was one of a vagabond, a sojourner, a stranger, an alien, a pilgrim. But he was looking towards something that was greater. And verses 15 and 16 tell us that all these patriarchal era figures, they were all looking for this greater city, this heavenly country. And it tells us that they had the opportunity to turn back. They could have turned around and given up, but they did not because they desired something so much greater. And the Hebrews writer tells us that because they not only desired this greater city, but did not turn back, what happened? God is not ashamed to be called their God. What an astounding and yet critically important blessing. We can't go without that. And therefore, what an indispensable admonition for us today. Let us seek the homeland. Let us seek the greater city. Let us seek the heavenly country. And let us live in a way that shows we are seeking it. So that, like Abraham and all the other people of God, spoken of here in Hebrews 11, we can be confident that God will not be ashamed to be called our God. Let us step out in faith, knowing God will care for us no matter what. Let us live holy lives. Let us live lives that serve God with reckless abandon, knowing there are things we know that are worth far more than silver and gold, like we sang this morning. Things that are worth far more, even more than the opinion of our friends and our neighbors and our co-workers, and even more than the opinions of our family. The fulfillment of promises made by God himself to us. That's worth more. Just as he made promises to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12, we have his promises today. And finally, let us seek that homeland that he's promised to us. Let us press toward that greater city that God has prepared for those who love him. Let us set out, not knowing where we are going, but knowing and trusting and loving the God we serve. Where we are going, I don't exactly know. But the one who has promised it to us, him we know, him we trust, him we serve, and him we love. Let us be pilgrims. Here we are but straying pilgrims. But if we are pilgrims here, one day we will reach a city where the smile of that blessed giver eternally gladdens all our longing eyes. What a blessed thought. If you're not a Christian, we urge you to become one so that you can look forward to the same thing. Believe in Jesus, repenting of your sin, and submit to God's transforming work in baptism as your sins are washed away. If we can help you do that this morning, we would love nothing more than to do that. If you have a spiritual need we can help you with, let it be known. Come forward while we stand and while we sing.